Brother Dan. Well, good evening. It certainly is good to be with you again tonight. I am, uh, as I said yesterday, I've really looked forward to this week to be able to come and to be with you and to spend a little bit of time in worship and leading you in Bible study. I appreciate the opportunity to spend a little bit of time with Matt and, uh, and his good wife. And as he said, he took me to a place that my daughter has always said, Dad, Dad, you just, you just got to come. Some, when you're down next time you're in Florence, you just got to go to Rick and Tony's. And, and so uh, at the invitation of Matt tonight, we went and it lived up to all of its hype, as I can assure you, uh, eating two of the bags of bread. And uh, so because of that, I might periodically be in the midst of a statement and go, excuse me, and uh, you just ignore and you can understand that then. But we'll make it through. We'll make it through. If you're visiting, we are thankful that you came out and to support the meeting tonight and and we hope that you'll be encouraged and we hope that you'll be edified. Um, I can't think of anything that I would love more than what we're doing right here. And that is to be gathered with God's people. To be able to declare how wonderful He is. What an incredible privilege. And to be able to take in our hands His Word. And to open it knowing that we actually hold in our hands God's communication to us. And as we're reading it, we're reading the very words of God. I mean, what an incredible privilege to be able to gather together and do that. And we're going to do that here for a few minutes. And if you were here yesterday, you know that what I like to do before each lesson is to ask God to bless us. And so if you don't mind, would you please bow with me again for just a moment. Father, we are again so thankful. It's a beautiful day you've given us. And what a wonderful evening. Father, we are so blessed to be able to come together and to now spend just a few moments in your word contemplating these things you've brought to us through your spirit. Father, we believe with all of our hearts that your word is without error. That, Father, you supernaturally supervised it in such a way that every word that the Bible writers originally wrote were the very words that you wanted written. And Father, we just pray that as we read these words that you'll find in us open hearts, you'll find eager spirits. Father, we not only want to know your word, but we want to do it. And so Father, we would ask you to bless us in these few moments that we spend in our study together, and we say, Amen. Well, if you brought your Bibles with you tonight and you want to follow along, and I hope that you will, you'll want to turn to Matthew chapter 13. Uh, as uh, it was mentioned just a moment ago during the prayer, uh, if you were here, you know this, maybe you're with us for the first time tonight. Uh, what we started to do yesterday after the morning service, beginning with Bible uh, class and, and then last night, I said what I really want to do is, is focus our thoughts this week around some of the parables of Jesus I mean, those are some of the most extraordinary teaching that you'll find anywhere in the New Testament. Uh, parables have just a way of, of drawing us into the teaching of Jesus like nothing else. Uh, he didn't inv invent the parabolic method. That method of teaching is as old as man, but nobody did it any better than Jesus Christ. And the word parable is a, is a word that literally means to cast alongside of or to throw alongside of. And, and what the idea is that Jesus takes a story, just an ordinary event in everyday life that people can really identify with, and he parallels it, he uses that to illustrate a deep spiritual truth. So you have an, an ordinary everyday event laying beside a deep spiritual truth. And so with that in mind, we want to look at an event uh, uh, that is uh, very familiar to the life of people. It's in Matthew chapter 13. Uh, it's one of the most familiar parables in the New Testament. All are familiar. Uh, but this one is a very short parable, but I think it has a real profound lesson for us that I really hope that we will contemplate tonight. And not only tonight, I really hope that you'll take, with, take it and you'll contemplate it when you leave here. Uh, you know, that really is the goal. Uh, 
what we're doing here tonight is we're exposing ourselves to the Word of God. We're sitting under the teaching of the Word. And we want that Word to really take root. And we want it to transform the way we think and the way we behave. We, it, it'll stimulate your thinking and your heart if you'll let it. And so with that in mind, look at the parable of the mustard seed. You'll find it in the 13th chapter of Matthew in verses 31 and 32. He presented another parable to them saying, The kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed which a man took and sowed in his field. And this is smaller than all the other seeds. But when it is full grown, it is larger than the garden plants and becomes a tree so that the birds of the air come and nest in its branches. Now every time I read the parable of the mustard seed, the first thing that always strikes me, the first thing that I'm always reminded of is actually how critics of the Bible love these two verses. And when I say critics of the Bible, I'm talking about people who reject the notion that it is the inspired Word of God and that they're just intent on undermining its integrity and undermining its authority. And they're always looking through Scripture. They are desperately searching for ways and places that they can point out errors to try to get people to say, well, maybe it's not the Word of God. Well, right here in these two verses, you'll find one of the favorite passages of Bible critics. They say, you know, Jesus made two errors here. First of all, he made the statement that the mustard seed is the smallest of all seeds. And we know that's not true. You know, fortunately, we live in a day and we live in an age where we have access to just about any kind of information we can even imagine. Someone asked me a question the other day. I, I had posted something online, a picture, and it was on the other side of the world, and it was in a harbor, and, and he noted in that picture behind us there were some stones that were uniquely shaped. And so he made the comment, he said, oh, what is something to the effect of what's up with the, the shape of that stone? Is that significant in any way? And I had no idea. But what I did is I just googled jack-shaped stones, hoping to get something. And there it was, at my fingertips. An explanation of everything that I could always want to know about coastal engineering and all of the different types of stones that are used in coastal engineering and what their purpose is and what they're really called. I mean, we have that access today. And so we live in a day and age where we say, ah, we know that the mustard seed is not the smallest seed in the world. There are a lot of different seeds that are smaller. And so these Bible critics say, Jesus then did one of two things. Uh, first of all, it's possible that he just made a mistake. The second possibility is he didn't make a mistake, but he just misled the people. He knew it wasn't true, but he just misled them, and they thought it was, and so he just kind of reinforced their thinking. Either way, they say, it makes Jesus unworthy of any kind of praise at all. Well, is it true? Did Jesus make a mistake there? No, it's not true. Jesus wasn't making a statement to the effect that in all of the world, the mustard seed is the smallest seed in existence. That's not the purpose. He's talking to people in the ancient land of Palestine. And when he says it's the smallest of all seeds, it was the smallest of all seeds in their context. They knew there was no other seed that was ever used in the gardens of Palestine that is as small as a mustard seed. In their world, in their understanding, in their context, it is an absolute truth. That's all that Jesus meant. And then they say, well, there's another error in there. He calls it a tree. And any botanist knows that a mustard plant is not a tree. Aha! Uh -huh. Again, Jesus makes some kind of error. 
Again, that is a desperate attempt to nitpick the words of Jesus to try to somehow find some way to undermine his credibility. But it simply doesn't work. Now, it's true that there are a lot of varieties of mustard plants that are pretty small. But what we do know is that the mustard plant that typically grew in ancient Palestine in the days of Jesus Christ could grow to be very large plants. In fact, they could grow to about 15 feet high. Now, just to kind of give you a perspective there, I'm about 6 foot 5, so you, you stack two of me on top of each other, and, you know, I'm about 13 feet, and then add a couple more feet on top of that. That is a pretty big plant. And not only could it be potentially about 15 feet high, but the branches could become so rigid that it was very common for it to become the home of birds. And so Jesus, again, isn't trying to make some type of scientifically perfect statement. None of us speak with that kind of scientific perfection. And we don't call each other on it all the time. You know, it reminds me of not long ago, I was driving down the road, my kids were in the back seat, and they're 20 and 21, and sometimes you would think they're 12 and 13, but, uh, and uh, if you've got kids, you know exactly what I mean about that. And so we're driving down the road, and we're, we're just getting out of uh, Franklin, where we live in Franklin, Tennessee, and, and Andrea says, oh, we're coming up to the, to the Buffalo house. And uh, what it is, is you're uh, driving 65 south, uh, uh, very close to Franklin. As you look over on your left, if you're going into Nashville, uh, it'll be over on your right. Uh, there's a farm there, and there's usually a couple of bison there. And so Andrea loves to see the bison. Well, she goes, oh, there's the buffalo. And Chris goes, it's not a buffalo. It's a bison. And Andrea goes, it's a buffalo. And Chris goes, no, it's a bison. And then they say, Dad, get your phone out and check it. And so I pulled out the phone, I handed it back to him, and, and, and she Googles it, and, and she pulls it up, and she begins to read, and, and technically it's true. It said that there's only two technically buffalo in the world, and they're in Africa, water buffalo and something else. And Chris goes, aha, I'm right. And then uh, she continued to read, and she said, but uh, bison, it's technically a bison, but it's often referred to as the American buffalo. And so Andrew's like, aha, I'm right. You know, they're looking for, he's trying to catch her on some kind of uh, precise uh, classification error. You know, when we all knew what she meant when she said, hey, that, that's a buffalo. You know, and we got to give people understand how we communicate. And Jesus communicated in a normal, natural way. And people took his words in a normal, natural, straightforward way. And so when he said tree, he wasn't making a mistake. He was simply communicating in language that they all understood and recognized. This is a big, big plant with rigid branches, and birds really could nest in it. I wanted to throw that little caveat out at you because it is one of those passages that you will find people trying to use and twist and manipulate to try to destroy the integrity of Jesus and the Bible. But it really is just snatching at straws. Now with that in mind, let's talk about the meaning of it. You know, as Jesus describes it, he says, this is what the kingdom of heaven is really like. It's like a mustard seed. Now, if you don't have any idea what a mustard seed looks like, let me give you a little perspective. If you've got a Bible, and it's a medium print Bible, and most of our Bibles are medium print, if you'll find a period on the page, you're looking at the size of a mustard seed, approximately. And so if you're looking down and you see a period on a medium print Bible, you can see that that is a very, very small seed. And the point that Jesus is making is this. When you look at a tiny mustard seed, when you look at a seed that's as big as a period in a medium print Bible, your natural inclination is not to think that it is going to produce a 15-foot tree that has very rigid branches 
that birds come along and nest in. It just doesn't seem to have that kind of potential in it. Now, if we knew what it was, a mustard seed, and we knew what it would produce, sure. But if you just saw that little spot, it just wouldn't be inclined to think that it would produce something of that size and scale. And he says, that's what the kingdom of heaven is like. As we think about the kingdom of heaven, there was nothing about the kingdom of heaven in its earliest days that would make anyone think that it was going to grow into a worldwide influential kingdom. No one would have ever thought that. Uh, first of all, there was the founder of the kingdom, Jesus Christ. I mean, if you just think about Jesus Christ, in so many ways, there wasn't a whole lot impressive about Christ from a worldly perspective, starting with his birth. I mean, here he comes along and he comes to earth and, and his parents, uh, when it came time uh, for him to be born, they, they, had to, they were surrounded by cows and they were surrounded by donkeys and they were surrounded by sheep. And Jesus was laid in a, in a feeding trough that we call a manger. That's not what you would expect when you think of royalty. And it's certainly not what you would expect when you would think of someone who's going to be a mover and a shaker to create the greatest kingdom the world has ever seen. And then when you think about where he was raised... Uh, after he was born there in Bethlehem and the family eventually after going to Egypt to uh, avoid uh, Herod and, 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 and then ultimately they come back into Israel, the, uh, the land of Palestine and they, they go back to Nazareth in the northern part of Galilee and they settle down there. You know, there was nothing special about that place. In fact, Nazareth was the armpit of Galilee. You might remember, in, in fact, if you uh, have your New Testament, you can just turn over to John chapter 1, and you might remember this statement early in the, uh, the ministry of Christ, right at the very outset when he was beginning his work. Uh, you have in verse 46, Nathaniel coming and, and saying uh, to Philip, when Philip says, hey, listen, we have found the one that Moses spoke about we found the one that the prophets wrote about we have found the Messiah we found the one we've been looking forward to for all of these centuries we found him we found him and he comes from Nazareth and then Nathaniel has that statement there uh, in verse 46 can any good thing come out of Nazareth and Philip said come and see can anything good come out of Nazareth uh, there wasn't anything special about that place. And then there's the fact, if you'll turn over just a few more chapters to John chapter 7, and you look in John chapter 7 about verse 15, you're going to see not only was Jesus born in a manger, not only was he raised in a little backwater village called Nazareth, but he had no formal training of the rabbis. You know, the most respected, the most intelligent the most influential spiritual people of the day were rabbis and they were well trained and they were well educated and as a result they were well respected. Jesus didn't have any of that. If you look there in chapter 7 of John and look at verse 15, the Jews were then astonished saying, how has this man become learned having never been educated? Not long ago I was watching a television show, a documentary on West Point. And they were talking about what it takes to get into West Point and the, the United States Military Academy. I'm sure most of you have heard of West Point. And, you know, it's one of those rigorous educational institutions. It's a leadership laboratory. It's very difficult to get in. And the graduates from West Point really constitute a who's who of great names in American history. I mean, not only is it a great liberal arts education, but they're taught leadership on a scale that's taught nowhere else. And then they go into the world and they take command of our troops all over the world and they rise through the ranks to become some of the greatest leaders in the world. 
And I was reading not too long ago on a magazine about how a lot of these big companies, they just covet these young officers who come through West Point and, and have such great command experience and they covet them for their company and they make great offers for them to come and be a part of their company. Now listen, if I'm going to start a movement and I have great aspirations for that movement, I'm, I'm going to want somebody like a West Point man or a West Point woman. You know, somebody that has this great education, maybe from the Ivy League. Je Jesus had none of that. He wasn't even educated. And not only wasn't he educated, he didn't have any wealth. He didn't come from the aristocracy. Uh, in fact, one of the great statements that tells about Jesus uh, that you'll find in the Gospels is in the Gospel of Luke about his status in terms of his relationship to material things. If you want to look over in Luke chapter 9, you'll find it there. Luke chapter 9, verses 57 and 58. As they were going along the road, someone said to him, I will follow you wherever you go. And Jesus said to him, The foxes have holes and the birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. He didn't have a lot of wealth. He didn't have education. Uh, he didn't have a, a great family pedigree. He lived in a, a little backwater village. There was just nothing really about Jesus that anyone would point to and say, you know, he is going to found a kingdom that will be from this point on eternal. And it will just continue to grow and it will envelop the entire world. And millions and millions and millions of people will profess Him to be their Lord and their Savior. No one would have looked at Jesus and said that. And then there was His core group of followers. Those 12 apostles. Listen, they were equally just ordinary um, Matt and I were talking about a book, in fact, at, at dinner. that uh, It's a great book. Uh, it talks about the, the fact that this core group that Jesus used as that foundational um, group that would change the world were just really just 12 ordinary men. And we see that also as we look through the New Testament. We can see statements from the Sanhedrin as... Peter and John are, are teaching and, and they're scratching their head and saying, these men have never been educated. And yet that was the group that Jesus used. And we can think about the group that first gathered right before Pentecost. In Acts chapter 1, you find the first gathering of people who are followers of Jesus Christ. This is the group. It's the foundation group. And if you want to look, why don't you turn over to Acts chapter 1 with me for just a second. And look at the numbers here. Acts chapter 1. Look down in verse 15. They're in the upper room. They're waiting for the promised Holy Spirit. Peter and the apostles are. But gathered with them on that occasion in verse 15. At this time, Peter stood up in the midst of the brethren. A gathering of about 120 persons was there together. And this is what he said. A gathering of 120 people. Now, you know as well as I do that if you were to think about a church that's about 120 in size, you would not say, wow, that's a big church. That's not a tiny church either. But you certainly wouldn't say, wow, that's a big church. It's not. It's really just kind of an average sized church. So when you look at all of these elements, Jesus himself, those 12 apostles who were uh, be the central leaders of the movement, this first group of 120 people, there's just simply no way that anyone would have put their money on the success of that kingdom. No one would. No one would have said, this venture is going to turn into something magnificent. And yet it did. You can see the whole principle of the mustard seed just working out from Acts chapter 2 forward. In fact, turn over to Acts chapter 2 and let's just start flipping through some things for just a minute. Acts chapter 2 starting in verse 41. So then those who had received His word were baptized. And that day there were added about 3,000 souls. 
Look at chapter 4 and look at verse 4. But many of those who had heard the message believed, and the number of men came to be about 5,000. Turn to chapter 5 and look down at verse 14. And all the more believers in the Lord, multitudes of men and women were constantly added to their number. Look at the next chapter, chapter 6, and look down at verse 7. The Word of God kept on spreading, and the number of the disciples continued to increase greatly in Jerusalem. And a great many of the priests were becoming obedient to the faith. Look at chapter 9, down in verse 31. Chapter 9, verse 31. So the church throughout all Judea and Galilee and Samaria enjoyed peace, being built up and going on in the fear of the Lord and in the comfort of the Holy Spirit. It continued to increase. Look at chapter 11 and look down in verse 21 of chapter 11. And the hand of the Lord was with them, and a large number who believed turned to the Lord. Next chapter, chapter 12, look down about verse 24. But the word of the Lord continued to grow and to be multiplied. Look at chapter 14, and look at the first verse of chapter 14. In Iconium they entered the synagogue of the Jews together and spoke in such a manner that a large number of people believed, both Jews and Greeks. Look at chapter 16, down about verse 5. So the churches were being strengthened in the faith and were increasing in number daily. Look at chapter 17 in verse 4. And some of them were persuaded and joined Paul and Silas along with a large number of the God-fearing Greeks and a number of the leading women. It's just an amazing story when we look at Acts chapter 2 and we begin to look at the history of the church and it truly is the mustard seed principle at work. This very unimpressive founder, this very unimpressive group of 12, this very unimpressive number of people at the beginning in Acts chapter 1, and suddenly by the time we get to Acts chapter 17, their word and their message is going all over the world, and people are coming in droves and responding by the thousands. And the kingdom of God is just swelling and swelling and swelling. It's an absolutely phenomenal, unimaginable dynamic. Well now, as we think about this principle of the mustard seed, and as we think about it in relationship to the kingdom, the question is, okay, what's the relevance to us? Uh, it's our so what moment in the lesson. As we study and we, and we just absorb what the words say, and we come to that moment, we go, okay, so what? So what does that mean to me? Is there really any relevance here other than saying, wow, look at that, that is really awesome. What happened that this small, uh, small, inconspicuous beginning became such a worldwide, visible kingdom? So what? Well, I think there are some principles here that we need to really remember as individuals and as a congregation. And here's the first principle that I want you to remember. As you think about the mustard seed, I want and I hope that you will always remember this principle. We need to remember as we read and reread this, these two verses from time to time, that we, not, we, we better never be victimized by bigness. Now let me say that again. This is a reminder. I think Jesus here has a secondary message to every one of his followers. Don't be victimized by bigness. Don't be paralyzed by bigness. And here's what I mean. I find all over the place individuals and churches that are paralyzed by bigness. Now, what that means is this. A lot of times congregations will say, 
And people in the congregations will say, Oh, if we were only a big church, think of the great things that we can do for the kingdom. If we were only a big church, can you imagine what God could do to us and through us? I mean, look at that church down the street. You know, they're three times bigger than we are. They're four times bigger than they are. They're five times bigger than we are. If we were only like that, then God could really use us in some remarkable ways to do incredible things for the kingdom. Uh, but we're not that big. We're just not that big. And they just kind of let their energy drain out of them. And they just kind of seem to lose a zeal for the kingdom because they think, what, what can God do with us? I mean, we're just a, a relatively small group of believers. Man, it, mm, if, we were, if we were only big. I know preachers who think that way. Well, you know, if I could, if I could only speak to these great, great throngs of people, if I could only speak to thousands of people. Man, I, I know I could have a great influence for the kingdom, but I, I don't get those opportunities. I just speak at relatively small places. You know, one of my great heroes of faith is not in the Bible. One of my great heroes of faith is a man by the name of David Lipscomb. You've heard of David Lipscomb. I just cannot begin to tell you what that man meant to the kingdom of God and how God used David Lipscomb. David Lipscomb was such a humble man. Uh, he was such a, a, a man so committed to following Jesus Christ after the Civil War, even though the South was absolutely destitute. There was nothing there was no food. There was no money. There was nothing. And he just knew he had to somehow start printing again for the benefit of the brothers and sisters in Christ a little periodical to inspire and to teach and to bring them together and grow now in the faith and, and, and push forward in the kingdom. The little paper called the gospel advocate that he started and there was no money and nobody had money for subscriptions and you couldn't get paper and but somehow David Lipscomb did it and 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 through the influence of his teaching and the work of the gospel advocate just great things were done but what I love most about Lipscomb is not his his work with the advocate and his work as a great educator and his determination to start a Bible school in Nashville on his farm. and Not that. What I love most about David Lipscomb was David Lipscomb as a preacher. And you may not know this about him. And if you've never read a biography, and there's a couple of great biographies on David Lipscomb, I would really recommend reading them. Uh, but you'll find out that David Lipscomb was not an eloquent speaker. He just wasn't. He knew he wasn't. Uh, there was nothing appealing about him as a preacher. But he preached everywhere he could. And he would oftentimes preach to very, very small groups. He didn't preach to large groups. There were preachers throughout the religious world of his day that commanded hundreds and thousands of people. David Lipscomb wasn't one of those. He would go to places and there would be three or four people and he would preach to them. Uh, he would go and uh, he would gather with a church in someone's house and there would be two or three people sitting on the bed and he would preach to them. And I would often preach to these groups and a new church would start in Donaldson, Tennessee and two people would be there and he would go out and it was a long trip from South Nashville to East Nashville today by horse and buggy and, and he would go there and he would preach to these two people and he, says, he would say, I'll come back next week if you each bring somebody. And so he'd come and there'd be three or four people. And the young preachers would ask him, what's the secret to preaching? And he said, 
The secret is this. When you find anybody who's just willing to listen, you just preach. And he said, it doesn't matter if it's two or three. And in fact, he told the young preachers, he said, listen, and this is one of my favorite statements he makes. He says, do not despise the day of small things. Do not despise the day of small things. God can do incredible things with small things. He used David Lipscomb in mighty ways and he spoke so consistently to little groups of people. There's others who say, you know, the Lord just... I don't think the Lord can use my... What's my 20 bucks a week? What's my $50 a week? What's my $150 a week? What's my $200 a week? What will that do? That's just, if I only had the money of Bill Gates, then I could do mighty things for the kingdom of God. If I only, you know, if I only was a millionaire, wow, God could use my money in such powerful ways, but I just, I don't have that much. He, he can't really do much with that. You know, I just am not as talented as that person. I'm not as gifted as that person. If only, if only, if only, if only, that's being victimized and paralyzed by bigness. And what this mustard seed parable tells us and reminds us is that God can do phenomenal things with things that don't look very impressive. God can use us, every single one of us, to do great things for the kingdom if we'll let Him. If we'll just let Him pick us up and use us as a tool, God can do incredible things. God can do incredible things through small congregations. Uh, I have so many stories. I wish I had time to share with you some of the great stories about little congregations and their support of different works and what came as a result of those little works. Great things. 